We're coming to Ephesians chapter 5. As we look at Ephesians chapter 5, I'm reading from verse 22. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 22, all through to the end. As we read, I want you to focus your mind on two things that are actually together. A godly marriage and a heavenly-minded family. Not just marriage, a godly marriage. Not just a family, a heavenly-minded family. As we read from verse 22 of Ephesians chapter 5, Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, therefore, as the church is submissive unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church, and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So ought men to love their own wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, even as the Lord the church. For we are members of his body, and of his flesh, and of his bones, for this cause, for this reason, to this end, shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery. But I speak concerning Christ and the church, nevertheless. Let every one of you in particular so love his wife, even as himself, and the wife see that she reverence, respect, or honor her husband. As we look at the scriptures, we find that marriage is God's own institution. It is something that God himself originated. And it is something that God himself began. And he gave it to humanity. As far back as Genesis, immediately he created man. Genesis, I'm reading from chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1. We're looking at verse 26. This talks generally about the creation of man. It's in chapter 2, you have in particular the coming of the woman and then the institution of marriage by God himself. Genesis chapter 1 verse 26, and God said, let us make man in our image after our own likeness. That shows the original plan and purpose of God. He wanted man that will be like him, spiritually, be like him also morally, so that the life will reflect 
the creator who has created us. So he said, let us make man in our image, at our likeness, and let them have dominion. It's not talking of, it's not a wanting to create a man that will be a puppet, a man that will be weak, a man with no spine, a man with no courage, a man with no lie to live, but a man that has dominion over everything on earth. In verse 27, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Then it says male and female created he them. We have the details in chapter 2. And after the creation in chapter 2 of the man, here is what God said. And the Lord God said, it is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a help meet for him, a help suitable for him, a help appropriate for him, a help that will support him, a help that will sustain the purpose for which I created him. That's already telling you the plan of God concerning marriage. And it's telling you the purpose of God concerning marriage and eventually God created Eve and brought Eve unto Adam and then Adam recognized that this is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh I am man and she will be called woman and then God establishes established at that time a principle for the rest of the world in all the generations that will follow. Look at verse 24. Therefore, that means because of that, because of what God had done for Adam and for Eve, therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother. It's not talking about Adam. Adam had no father, had no mother. He's saying, because of what I have done for Adam and Eve, and I created them one after the other, and I brought them together. I originated the union. In all the marriages that will follow, he will originate the union. In your marriage, if you are not married yet, he will originate that union. And then in all the marriages that will follow, I'm going to take this person, Adam and Eve, as a pattern. As a model, here is what I've done. He has the power to do it. He has not changed. He has not changed. He will do it in your life in Jesus' name. He says, therefore, shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife. It says, you leave one relationship to come into a lasting relationship and they shall be one flesh. You see, in that original plan of God, one man, one woman, that original plan says God does not want polygamy. And you see, there was nothing that Adam could do to divorce Eve and marry another. There's no other woman. God created only one. It shows the plan of God from the original creation and institution of marriage. Monogamy, one man, one woman. Not only that, created Eve to be different from Adam. A male and a female. Not a male and a male. A man and a woman. Not a man and a man. It shows the original intention of God. And it says, therefore... Shall a man leave father and mother? He says, what I have done here now is a symbol, is a foundation, is a step, is a springboard to all the marriages that will follow after one man, one wife. And then a man and a woman. And then there is no chance for divorce. In fact, the word of God tells us very clearly that God hates divorce or putting away malachi chapter 2 in malachi chapter 2 i'm reading from verse 14 because marriage today 
should still follow God's plan. And if the world has forgotten the standard of God, the plan of God, the purpose of God, the church must remember the plan of God and must follow after that plan of God. Things may change, but God never changes. Malachi chapter 2 verse 14. Yet ye say, wherefore, because the Lord has been witness between you, between thee, and the wife of the youth, the wife, singular, of the youth, your very first wife, against whom thou hast dealt treacherously. Yet she is thy companion. You have dealt treacherously. You have been unfaithful to her. You have driven her out. You have put her away. And yet in the mind of God, she is, even to this present time, thy companion and the wife of thy covenant. The Lord established marriage as a covenant. It's not just, you know, I'll be your friend, you'll be my friend. We'll live together, we'll plan together, we'll do things together. It's not something we do privately. A covenant is a public thing. There are people that are asking us, can we not just decide to take uh, the woman and then privately we we agree together because um, it's an agreement between us and we can make it as private as we want to. No, you cannot because it's a covenant. And a covenant is not a secret thing. It's a covenant you make before God. And you make before the people of God. That's why it says, is the wife of thy covenant. Look at verse 15. And did he not, did not he make one? It's going back to Genesis. It's going back to the original plan. And it said, didn't he make one? Yet it says that had he not, had see the residue of the spirit, and wherefore one? Why did he make one? The man and the woman. For them to come together as one. That he might seek a godly seed. Godly marriage, heavenly minded family. That he might seek a godly seed. Therefore, take it. Therefore, watch. Therefore, take caution. Therefore, beware. Therefore, take heed to your spirit and let none deal treacherously against the wife of his youth. For the Lord, the God of Israel, says that he hateth, tell me, putting away, he hateth divorce. He hated separation. He hated, go your way, I go my way. You see, marriage is not just your private affair. Marriage is not ju just your private decision. God is involved in this. And because God is involved, eternity is involved. You see, after all, marriage is an earthly thing. And whatever I do, that's just my personal choice. If I decide I don't want to continue, that's me. No, that's not just you. God is involved. And it says, God hated putting away. And then it goes on to tell us what will happen. He says, for one covered violence with his garment, says the Lord of hosts. He's saying that there's so much violence in homes, so much um, wife beating, husband nagging at home. And God says, it's not just, just that you live together, he wants you to have peace together. There will be peace in our families. It's not just that we are tolerating each other. No, we are affectionate with each other. And then it goes on to say, Therefore, take heed to your spirit that ye deal not treacherously. As you come to the New Testament, again you find the same thing. That as Jesus referred back to marriage, 
He didn't uh, refer to the time of David or the time of Abraham or the time of Moses. He went right back to the beginning. We're looking at Matthew chapter 19. In Matthew chapter 19, I'm reading here from verse 3. Matthew chapter 19, we're looking at verse 3. A godly marriage and a heavenly minded family. In Matthew chapter 19 verse 3, and the Pharisees also came unto him, tempting him, and saying unto him, is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for every cause? Look at that question. It wasn't actually a sincere question. The people that came asking the question, the Pharisees, they were not thinking of solving anybody's problem. They wanted to put Jesus Christ in a bad light. They wanted to try, they wanted to trip him, trick him, and trap him into something that he will say that the other the people that were listening to him will say that that's you know we'll see what he has said well they wanted to hinder the salvation of the people they wanted to put a barrier between the savior and the sinner that he ought to save they wanted to say now if you're having marriage problem and let, let's hear what jesus will say you're following him you're listening to him you're paying attention a rapt attention i see if he is saying the truth okay we're going to ask him a question tempting him these were pharisees some believers i pray you'll not be like that i said you will not be like that you see, when we ask questions, it should be that we are interested in solution. That we really want the problem answered or the problem solved and the question answered will edify us and edify other people. And he answered and said unto them, have you not read? Or are you asking me? Don't you read? Are you not the preachers in the synagogue? Don't you have the word? Have ye not read that he which made them when? Tell me out loud. At the beginning. Don't follow any modern modification. Don't follow any kind of modern thing that anybody, the new generation people, what they're saying, what they're bringing. It says, have you not read that he which made them at the beginning made them Male, how many? Female, how many? One man, one wife. And said, for this cause shall a man leave father and mother and shall cleave unto his wife. And they twain shall be one flesh. I pray that we'll stay with the words of Jesus in Jesus' name. As we look at this today. And we're going to go back to Ephesians chapter 5, from verse 22, all through to verse 33. There are three things we're going to consider. Number one, permanent partnership in a scriptural marriage. Permanent partnership in a scriptural marriage. Let's come to Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5. I will see the plan of God, the purpose of God, and the program of God for the man and the woman, the husband and the wife. As we read from verse 22, it says, Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. Verse 23, for the husband is the head of the wife. The husband is the head of the wife. Let, let's stop there for a moment. For those of us who are planning to get married, who are praying to get married, the head determines the direction of the body. Our head naturally determines how far our bodies will go. Our head determines how far the hand can work. Our heads determine how far the feet will travel. Our head determines how far the whole body will move. That's why you want to think through. And you want to plan very well. 
And you want to pray very well. Because once you have this man as your head, you are joined together as the head is joined with the body. And no matter how clever you are, no matter how serious you are, no matter how spiritual you appear to be now without that man, once you come together, you'll not go farther than that head can carry you. That, that's the plan of God. That's one thing. It's the head and the body united together too. It's only this that separates the head and the body. Once you have, look at the man. If you cut off that head, the body is dead and the head is dead. That means then in the union, in marriage, in the mind of God is the head and the body. And to do anything and to sever them, to separate them, to cut off the head is to kill the marriage and to kill both of them. Because in the mind of God, the union is the union of the head and the body. Not only that, the head is the one that plans and thinks and foresees and will project for the body. What can the hand write without the head? And what can the hand produce without the head? What can the hand manufacture without the head? You are literally paralyzed. You are impotent. You are weak. You are anemic. You have nothing you can do without a good head. That means then, as you are planning, I want to get married. I want to get good. God wants you to get married. In fact, he is planning for you. I said he's planning for you. Why don't you ask him? Because when you find a wife, when you find a husband, that wife is from the Lord. And I believe that this morning, before you even pray, he has it for you already. And all you need is the revelation. You know, you've been looking here and looking there. Revelation will come to you in Jesus' name. We're looking at, we're looking at Proverbs chapter 18. And I'm reading from verse 22. Uh, by Proverbs chapter 18, verse 22. Whoso findeth a wife, findeth, findeth. No, not something we regret about. Had I known, if you find a wife from the Lord, you'll find a good, good thing. Give me a good amen there. Yeah. And obtain a favor of the Lord. It's the Lord's doing. It says, you obtain a favor of the Lord. But the question is, how can I receive that favor of the Lord? Uh, there are times that people make things very much complicated. And uh, it's like what God makes simple. The people, they complicated it. Look at, um, look at Adam. Adam did not have any lecture, any message. Adam did not have any kind of encouragement. Adam did not have any kind of counseling or demonstration of this. Adam did not have a previous example. How will I know? You will know. How will I be able to tell? You will tell. God created Eve because when God was going to make Eve, Adam was actually sleeping. And it wasn't ordinary, you know, sleep from 10 p.m. to uh, 4 a.m. or 5 a.m. This was deep sleep that God performed an operation and removed a rib and made a woman. And Adam did not know anything going on. As he woke up like this, God said, I've been thinking about you. As we wake up tomorrow morning, I've been thinking about you. God is thinking about you in Jesus' name. And then he said, look at what I have for you. And immediately Adam recognized, that's my bone. That's my flesh. You will recognize. When God guides, it's very simple. 
He will tell you in your heart. But you must believe the voice of God that is coming to your heart. You must believe the recognition. But if you if you know it in your heart, am I making a mistake? Ah, am I sure? What if and what if? Then you destroy the plan God has for you. You will not destroy that plan. I'm looking at uh, Psalm 25. I'm reading from verse 9. Psalm 25 verse 9. The meek will he guide in judgment. That's what judgment means, in decision. As you are making decision, the Lord will guide you. The meek will he teach his way. He will tell you. He will make you to know. After all, he has uh, that uh, sister for you, or he has that brother for you. If he has been preparing the person for you and brings the person to you, he will help you to recognize. You will recognize. All the dimness of sight and all the doubts in our hearts this morning, they are wiped away in Jesus' name. We're looking at Psalm 32, verse 8. I will instruct thee and teach thee in the way which thou shalt go. You missed an amen there. Yeah. I will guide thee with mine eyes. He is a father. Hasn't your earthly father asked you, my daughter, when are you getting married? If your earthly father is concerned, our heavenly father is more concerned. Hasn't your mother asked you, my brother, how about, uh, you know, the, are you not, don't you marry in your church? When are you going to get married? I want you to get married so that I can carry your children. If mommy has said that, don't you think that God loves you more than mommy? And what mommy is asking for is the will of God. And God is more interested than you are. It's just that you have not been paying attention. You will pay attention. And the Lord himself, he will fulfill his will in your life in Jesus' name. Because it's a permanent partnership. A permanent relationship. That's why we don't just jump into it. He leads us and he's saying, this is the one I'm choosing for you. It will be for life. It will be for life in Jesus' name. Not something to tolerate, not something to endure, something to enjoy. Ah, I've lost my congregation. It will come in Jesus' name. And look at uh, Jeremiah chapter 29. Jeremiah chapter 29, and I'm reading from verse 11. This is talking about you. I said it's talking about you. For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, says the Lord. Thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you an expected end. To give you an expected end. I pray that everything that has seen that, that expectation will be canceled this morning. Then shall ye call upon me, and ye shall go and pray unto me. Tell me the rest of that verse 12. I will hack in unto you. I will hack in unto you. I will hack in unto you. He will listen to you in Jesus' name. This year, 2015, was the best year you ever lived in your life in Jesus' name. Whatever you missed in the past years, everything is coming this year. All barriers are taken away. All doors are open. You will pray and God will hearken unto you. And you shall seek me and find me when you shall search for me with all your heart. You search for him with all your heart. He will answer you. And then he will give you the request that you are asking of him. Uh, just a word of caution. In uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 6. 2 Corinthians chapter 6. I want you to understand there are times that we may have need in our body. And the need may appear so pressing. But it's the devil that is painting the picture of pressure. Uh, the devil is saying, if you don't uh, have that now, when else will you have that? And the Lord is coming. is coming with what belongs to you. And just before he gets there, and the devil knows, he knows that the Lord is bringing, you have been praying for how many years now? And this is the year of the answer. 
and you have been talking to the Lord, asking the Lord, and the Lord is saying, I remember you. I will do it. I said, you will do it. And then somebody then turns to be like an Esau. It's coming from the field. And he's saying, I am fainting. And what am I going to do? And Jacob said, all right, I'll give you food. Only on one condition. Sell your birthright. You have a birthright. You have a privilege. And you have that which God has appointed for you. But Satan painted a picture as if if you don't eat now, now, you will die. And so he said, okay, what's birthright? What am I going to do with birthright? And he sold the birthright, and then he edged, and he went his way. There are people that are thinking it will never happen. When? It will happen this year. Yeah. And so because they have lost hope, their prayer has been answered already, because when Daniel prayed, it appeared there was no answer. But God had sent the answer. And the angel came 21 days after. 21 days, that's only three weeks. My sister, you've been waiting for two, three years. You can wait for three weeks. I said you can wait for three weeks. And then, brother, you've been waiting and praying and praying all these many years. Just 21 days, you will wait. You send your cards to me. I said, you'll send your cards to me. So the angel said, I was already coming. But Satan, with the spirits, the prince of Persia, stopped him. All those princes of Persia hindering the answer to come at the right time. That's why we're here. We'll break every yoke. We'll destroy the works of the devil. He has given us the authority. He said, whatsoever we bind on earth, tell me, it's bound in heaven. And you are part of this church. Your problem is our problem. Your concern is our concern. It will happen. But don't stretch your hand in the wrong place and take the wrong thing before it comes because it's coming very soon. Here is the question now, 2 Corinthians chapter 6, reading from verse 14. Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. Don't go that direction. Don't go the direction of Esau. Don't say, I'm fed up. Whatever comes now, I will take. You are better than that. You are more precious than that. It's going to give you the expected edge. For what fellowship has righteousness with unrighteousness? Or what communion has light with darkness? And what concord has Christ with Belial? Or what part has he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them. I will walk in them. I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Verse 17, wherefore, come out from among them. Don't strike any deal with an unbeliever. Don't make any promise to that unbeliever. Don't sell yourself into the hands of that unbeliever. And don't say, well, whatever, marriage is marriage. Uh-uh, we're talking about godly marriage. You will have a godly marriage. There are godless marriages where those people, they fight like a rat and cat every night. Your marriage will not be like that. You know, the man is drunk and the woman has to be, you know, gathering all the vomit and everything. You will not be like that. The man is in occultism and there is a child of Satan. You will not be daughter-in-law to Satan. You will not be son-in-law to Satan. Leave them alone. Let them do their own worldly marriage. Yours is going to be a godly marriage. Wherefore, come out from among them. And be ye separate, says the Lord. And touch not the unclean thing. And I will receive you. I will be a father unto you. And ye shall be my sons. And my daughter says the Lord Almighty. And let's come back to Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5, and I'm reading from verse 23, and I'm reading from verse 28. Verse 23, it says, 
For the husband is the head of the wife. Even as Christ is the head of the church. And he is the savior of the body. Verse 28. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. You see the intimacy. You see the union. You see how they are connected together. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. Loveth himself. And already the New Testament tells us the reason why we get married. One of the reasons in um, 1 Corinthians chapter 7. 1 Corinthians chapter 7. We're reading from verse 2. Nevertheless, to avoid fornication, let how many people? Every man tell me out loud. Ah, say it as if you know you are part of this. Let every man have his own wife. And let every woman have her own husband. That means, think about this. For God to create a woman, a masterpiece, and put a lot into that woman, emotionally, spiritually, morally, physically, and he says, I have made this just for you and for you alone. The man having his own wife is glorious. I said it's glorious. That's exactly what God did for Adam. And he said, it is yours and yours alone. And the woman that is yours and yours alone you'll make the discovery this year. The one, the, the man that is yours and yours alone without anybody sharing with you, you will make the discovery this year in Jesus' name. Look at verse 39. In verse 39, the wife is bound by the Lord as long as her husband lives. But if her husband be dead, she's at liberty to be married. This is what I want you to look at. To be married to whom she will. To be married to whom she will. Only in the Lord. What does that mean? Paul said, when you are a believer and you are prayed and God has revealed the woman to you, he says, you are free to marry in the Lord. Not an unbeliever, not a sinner. You are free to marry whom the Lord has revealed to you, not whom Paul, the apostle, has revealed to you, whom he will. And the same thing for the woman, whom she will. It's not the church that will choose for you. It's not the church that will say, ah, ah, you're a believer. Yes, we know that woman is a believer, but you cannot marry that one. You're not good enough for that one. Or oh, she is too much for you. It's too, too precious for you. Who are you? If you're a believer, you go to pray. It says in this place, you are at liberty to be married to whom she will, to whom he will, only in the Lord. Nobody will stand in your way. If anybody has been standing in your way because of ignorance, wanting to play God, Wanting to act as if he is stronger than God or is God. The Lord will give them humility. The Lord will make them realize that God is God. And whoever God has chosen for you will be yours in Jesus' name. And don't worry, don't fight with anybody. God will defend you. And God will protect his plan for you in Jesus' name. But let's remember, once that marriage is done, once we come together, we are together, you are together until death do your part. Just like I read to you, the husband is the head, the wife is the body, and they are joined together. Only death can separate the head and the body. Mark chapter 10. In Mark chapter 10, Verse 2, and the Pharisees came to him and, uh, and asked him, Is it lawful for a man to put away his wife 
tempting him. And he answered and said and said unto them, What did Moses command you? And they said, Moses suffered, permitted, allowed to write a bill of divorcement and put her away. And Jesus said unto them, For the hardness of your heart, he wrote you this precept. Here is where we need to have understanding of the scriptures. There are people that go to the Old Testament. They pull out a verse and they say, Pastor, Pastor, see this one. Yes, I see it. It says I can do this, I can do that. You know, it doesn't say you can do that. It said they at that time could do that. Are we not all the same? No, we're not the same. Jesus said that Moses permitted them, not that he commanded them, he allowed them for the hardness of their heart. Why did Jesus come? Jesus came to take that hardness away. And that's what God was always uh, challenging the Israelites about. And that's what uh, Stephen said. He said, you are uncircumcised in heart and ears. You still retain the hardness of heart. It's brought Jesus to you as your Savior. You are rejecting him. You don't want to follow those people that have the hardness of heart. You want to come to them and say, Lord, hardness of heart is taken away. What's your original plan? What's your perfect plan? Well, let, let's go now, it says. But from the beginning of creation, God made them male, how many? And female, how many? One man, one woman. Not man and man, not female and female. A male, a female. A man, a woman. It says, and for this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife. And that when shall be, tell me out loud. Amen. You know what the modern society has done? They say it's because of economy. They say it's because of education. They say it's because of civilization. The husband is living here in this city, and the wife, education, industry, economy, position, Whatever, the wife is living in the same country but in another town. How are they one flesh in practical terms, in pragmatic terms, in definite evident terms? There are people, although they are, li they are living in the same country, they barely see each other, only telephone. That's not the perfect will of God. Let not money come before the marriage. Let not education come before the marriage. Let no other human consideration come before the marriage. Oh, but you say, I know brother so-and-so, and he's a Christian man, and, uh, you know, they are living separate. Again, you are going back to permissive will. You're not going to perfect will. You're going back to for the hardness of their heart because they say they want money at all costs, they want days at all costs, and they put that thing above the marriage, above a godly marriage. That's why it goes, okay, if that's the way you want to go, that's all right. Your, your marriage, your telephone will help your marriage. Telephone will be your connection. If uh, the connecting uh, source of the telephone, if it fails, your marriage will be as good as, you know, the telephone connection. That's not the perfect will of God. It says what God has joined together. Let no man tell me out loud. Put asunder. We'll stay together in Jesus' name. And uh, you will love each other, not just that you are tolerating each other. And if there is chance to separate, you will take that chance. If somebody tells, ah, brother so and so, they did that too. I know sister so and so, uh, she is in uh, Japan, and the husband is in, you know, another country, and they are still married. They are not divorced. Is that the perfect will of God? I said, is that the perfect will of God? Okay, let's, let me leave brother so and so. Let me come to you. Is that how your marriage will be? Is that how your marriage will be? You will stay together in Jesus' name. Now, don't drop your head when I look at you. Look at me. 
I say when I look at you, look at me. Because something better is coming this year. Something greater is coming this year. And the Lord will perfect your relationship in Jesus' name. Well, that, that's what the Lord himself has revealed to us. And he says, the husband is to love the wife. The wife is to love the husband. I, I can, I, I, I'm going to ask you a question. Now, when you were planning to get married, during the courtship, was there any agreement? There cannot be any agreement like this now. My sister, when we get married, I am going to uh, give you permission to go to China. And I had the dream of going to Ukraine. And so, and we might be like that for 10 years. If the man had said that during Koshi, would you have said, praise the Lord, I accept that's the will of God? No. Why well, see that after the marriage, all the good, good things were said during courtship, we'll be together, we'll stay together, we'll build a family together, we'll be the home together, we'll do this, we'll do that, and we'll serve God together. How is it that after the marriage, we'll break everything, we're coming back again together. And the Lord will help you in Jesus' name. Love each other. Love each other. Titus, I'm reading from chapter 2, verse 4. Titus. Chapter 2, and we're reading from verse 4. Titus chapter 2, reading from verse 4. It says in verse 4 that they may teach the young women to be sober and to love their husbands. Teach them to love their husbands and to love their children. And then it says to be discreet, chaste, keep us at home. Homemaker, keep us at home, helping the man. That's why you are married. Staying with the man. That's why you are married. Sustaining that man. That's why you are married. Keeping together. That's why you are married. It says, keep us at home and good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. Point number two. We're coming back to Ephesians chapter five. Ephesians chapter 5, and I'm reading here from verse 25. The priceless provision for a sanctified membership. Priceless provision for a sanctified membership. It come, we come to verse 25. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church, and gave himself for each that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. Paul the apostle talking about marriage brings in the church. Is it um, an inappropriate illustration? No. Already he told us in verse 23, for the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. He's saying the relationship between Christ and the church should be a pattern, a model, a standard for the relationship between a man and the wife in a godly marriage and in a heavenly-minded family. And there he brings in the provision of the Lord. Look at verse 30. For we are members of his body and of his flesh and of his bones. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and shall be joined unto his wife and they too shall be, tell me, one flesh. This is a great mystery. That is, as we're talking about marriage, we're talking about the relationship between Christ and the church. He said, it's a mystery. Many people do not think about that. If we think about that, you'll say, my marriage must reflect the relationship between Christ and the church. The relationship between Christ and the church must supply illustration for my marriage. You take that as a model, that as a pattern, and you're looking at that, and you want it to be like that, your marriage will be like that. The Lord so loved the church 
that he gave himself, gave himself for the purity and the sanctification of that church. Look at Titus chapter 2. In Titus chapter 2, we're looking at verse 14. Who gave himself for us, for us the church, that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people zealous of good works. He makes all the supply we need, all the provision we need, so that it will feed us for heaven eventually. And that's the purpose of Christ. It's not just that we have relationship with him here on earth, and then in heaven we are missing. You will not be missing in heaven. The relationship that has started between you and Christ here on earth will continue until eternity in heaven in Jesus' name. How will that happen? That's what Christ made provision for. He says, I've saved you now, but I will see you in heaven. I'm making a place for you in heaven. You'll be there. I said you'll be there. Where are you? You'll be there. In Jesus' name, you will be there. But what provision has he made for us to be there to sanctify us? In uh, Hebrews chapter 13, I'm reading from verse 12. Wherefore, Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered without the gauge. Let us go forth, therefore, unto him without the gauge, bearing his reproach. For here, this is the purpose for the sanctification, for here we have no continuing city, but we seek one to come. I will be there. I will be there. Point number one, permanent partnership in a scriptural marriage. Point number two, precious, oh sorry, priceless provision for a sanctified membership. Point number three now, practical perception of a symbolic mystery. A symbolic mystery. And let's come to Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5, and we're reading from verse 32. You will see here, it says that this is a great mystery. Ephesians chapter 5, reading from verse 32. This is a great mystery. That is, the people who are reading about this, who have a low view of marriage. A low view estimation of the family. And they just think that marriage is uh, for convenience. Marriage is for make it make to make life easy here. I need somebody to cook my food. I need somebody to help me do this. And then I need somebody to do that and do that. And they think it's only, but if I can do without that, if I can do without somebody helping me here, helping me here, and I'm an all around man. I can cook, I can wash my clothes, I can make my, make my room and all that. If I can do that, what do I need marriage for? He said, you're missing the mystery. He said, this is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. I pray that the low view anyone has about marriage, that low view will be canceled today. You see, the children of Israel, they need to understand that the relationship between God and Israel was the relationship between the husband and the wife. And because they missed it, that's why they just made marriage anyhow. And that's why they put marriage to a low level. And they can kick out the woman anytime, bring another woman. They can make this allegation and uh, make that the reason to put her away. Because they didn't realize the great mystery. Look at the mystery for them. Isaiah chapter 54. In Isaiah chapter 54, I'm reading from verse 5. Isaiah chapter 54, verse 5. For thy maker is thine husband. The Lord of hosts is his name. Thy redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, the God of the whole earth, shall he be called. That was a mystery for them. They didn't understand. And the Lord was saying, the covenant I made with you, an everlasting covenant. The covenant I made with you, the covenant of peace. The covenant I made with you. I'll take you out of this barren land. I will take you to the fruitful land. It's a covenant similar to the covenant of marriage. It's everlasting. 
It's unbreakable. It's undeniable. And that is a mystery in their relationship with their wives, their husbands in the Old Testament, but they didn't understand. And so they made marriage very cheap. Now we come to the New Testament, and the Lord is now telling us Israel failed because they didn't understand that mystery. Second Corinthians chapter 11. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, and I'm reading from verse 2. It says, they failed, we will not fail. In 2 Corinthians 11, verse 2, For I am jealous over you, with godly jealousy. For I have espoused you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. You see that? That's a mystery. He wants us to understand that marriage is not just this earthly thing here. It is symbolic of the mystery of the union between Christ and the church. Revelation chapter 19. Revelation chapter 19, we're reading from verses 7 and 8. Revelation chapter 19, and we're reading from verses 7 and 8, the mystery of the union of Christ with the church, like husband to the wife. It says in Revelation chapter 19, verse 7, Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb is come. That's of Jesus, of our Redeemer. Behold, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. The marriage of the Lamb is come. And his wife, think about that. See the mystery. The church, his wife, has made herself ready. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. Let's come back now to our marriage. Now that you know that marriage is to represent the union between Christ and the church, you want to make this great mystery. In reality, something practical in your own personal family, in your own heavenly-minded family. As we look at Ephesians now, chapter 5, we're going to look at how do we make this marriage, this family, the model it ought to be. How do we make this uh, family and this uh, marriage the symbol it ought to be in the sight of God? And let's come to Ephesians chapter 5. And we're looking at verses 22 uh, all through to verse 33. But I'm going to uh, point out what we're looking for. We're looking for the action verbs, active verbs in the relationship. You see, what the Lord has done for us is to give us verbs. You have received the message from our pastor, Pastor W.F. Kumoye, the general superintendent of the Palais Bible Church. It is my wish that as you listen, you will accept the whole world and you will let them sink into the, your hearts. And by the grace of the Lord, you will never regret it. It is my prayer that by next week, when our, our pastor shall come up again, to present another message, you will be there, your family will be there, and your friends. And I believe as you are listening to the message every week, by the grace of the Lord, you will never be the same. Let us pray. Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank you, O Lord, because of today's message. We thank you, O Lord, because of the one you let us listen to last week, and the one we are going to listen to the next week, by the power and the blood of Jesus Christ. If you tarry, we shall listen together once again next week. And if not, every one of us will be there with you in the kingdom of God in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord, because you are the Lord that answers prayer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.